Good afternoon. My name is Rhonda Hayes and I teach BCIS and coordinator for that and for the Oracle program. And we are actually here today and we have Dr. Chapman who is going to actually we're going to have a discussion about the common book, uh, Notes from a Young Black Chef. So I'm really looking forward to this interview with Dr. Chapman. Thank you so much. So Dr. Chapman, if you would please introduce yourself. I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Hayes. Uh, so I'm Dr. Kenneth Chapman, Executive Dean of Liberal Arts from North Lake Campus. I'm excited to be a part of this journey for the common book. Um, and really what it's going to bring to our campus and what's going to really bring to our district is that much. So and definitely excited to be interviewed by one of North Lake's finest, Dr. Ron Pitts. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get started. How do you define tenacity? Yeah, so tenacity to me uh, is, in the textbook definition is, you know, the energy or the power, empowerment, uh, the focus to get things done or to, to get through. Uh, but I have a unique uh, self-definition, which is um, steadfastness. I uh, often utilize the, the, word, like the word grit, steadfastness, tenacity. And so I always equate steadfastness with tenacity because particularly being a black male, I define as a black male academic, um, and we often associate grit with having everything that you need and you control uh, the systems and control the environment to be tenacious. Um, and so I would posit or argue that uh, I have steadfastness to, to bear through the things that I can't change, which is by proxy makes me tenacious and have tenacity. And so I, I love the use of that. Uh, grit is great, but I don't think everybody has grit. I think some of us are equipped with steadfastness, which is kind of the inverse of grit, meaning that you have what you need to bear through. And so both, I think, lend itself to tenacity. But that would be my definition is uh, having steadfastness to get through, to get to your goals, to advance, to come up uh, to higher levels of deeper goals. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Okay, next question. In notes from a young black chef, Kwame tells us his story, how he grew up to become a chef. What does your story look like, and how did you get to where you are now? Great question. So. Um, born and raised in a small inner city, city, inner city suburb of Oklahoma City called Dell City, Oklahoma, which is a dot on the map. Uh, and I have two younger sisters, uh, mom and dad. My dad was a prison guard, mom was a reservation for her. Um, so we always got free rentals. Uh, we'll throw that in there. Uh, and grew up in Dell City, Oklahoma, and didn't really have a love for education. Uh, my journey, uh, I, tried athletics, um, but that didn't work out for me. And I tried other uh, identities that didn't work out for me that I love to read, but never had the desire to be uh, educated, if you will. I always felt like I was missing something. So I, um, I was the class clown. I was everything but studied and learned, learned as they say in the country. Um, and so I, uh, I, I squandered a lot of my years not applying myself. Um, so I went to undergrad at the University of Central Oklahoma um, and did communication, got a communications degree. Um, and I always tell the story about how I was pre-law first and then I had to do a bunch of readings. So I, got to do that. Uh, I was pre-med and then I found out about that I can't get blood, so I dropped out of that. And then I ended up with communications, which has lended me well because it comes from a circle because I love hearing myself talk. Um, and I think I'm typically a good communicator, particularly doing diversity work. Uh, that being kind of my passion in higher education. Uh, and my professional journey started as a bank teller to put myself through school, left from that and went to financial crimes analyst, where I worked with Secret Service and FBI, working money laundering cases, was miserable because I didn't have a business background or accounting background, but I talked my way into that. Did that for a number of years and made really good money at a young age, but the adage is true, money can't buy happiness. So one day I just quit, um, dropped out of an MBA program, quit that banking job, went and got a master's in education, started as an academic advisor, and uh, worked with international students, and have been in education ever since and have loved it. Um, left from there, I took a, worked at a College of Medicine, where I did diversity work in the College of Medicine, including um, doctor, diverse doctors, uh, and then left there and was assistant dean of diversity at a private school, 
left there and then built a diversity program at the University of Oklahoma, where I was a faculty member, did my doctoral uh, graduate work at um, in business, liberal studies, and um, education. So I've kind of been a hodgepodge all over the place. Um, and then from there, arrived at North Lake College, which is the full academic side, which I uh, have loved ever since because it allows me to kind of do a little bit of everything and work with some really awesome people. I think more so I'm a sociologist. Uh, in mind, not in practice, uh, education degrees and sociologists such as well, uh, being around people and learning about people. So that's kind of my, my journey. Thank you so much. It's interesting. Okay, next question. One of the things Kwame focuses on are the many and varied obstacles he faced on his journey so far. What obstacles have you had to overcome along the way? Yeah, um, so... So many. I think back to when I was in banking, how um, there was an older white gentleman who told me, you know, uh, you need to wear a suit every day and grow your beard out because nobody's going to take you serious. Because um, when you look so young, you look like a baby too. There's not very many black men around here, and you know, you could be perceived as a certain way. Um, and so, and I love my beard, and I got the COVID beard going on now. But you know, I that just kind of. It put me kind of in a interesting predicament because I wanted to be successful, but I didn't want to like lose myself to someone else's norms to be successful. Like, why couldn't I be me? Um, and so that that was one obstacle was just trying to cater to others' norms. And then I think the other piece too is you know going to get a master's degree and being in education. Um, you know, there's people from my own community, the black community, who told me that you know, you're sold out because you went and got a PhD or you, you talk white now, you articulate your words, um, or you live in Frisco now. Like, that is, you know, that's a sellout. You're not in Del City, Oklahoma anymore. And I'm like, but what is white? Like, what is pronouncing my words? What is white about that? Just because, you know, I can still talk to you my street language. I, I really, really do it. But it comes out every now and then, right? Uh, but, you know, that, that conflict between, you know, who I am and what I was and, you know, not what I'm trying to be, but just like, just uh, like I take pride in how I talk and interact with individuals. And so, you know, that, that obstacle of uh, code switching is the term, you know, that I have to constantly change myself, be a chameleon and change in certain environments. And so sometimes it's, it's stressful uh, because you'll go into a meeting and you'll know people in this room uh, don't take you serious. Uh, and because of your race, because of maybe where you come from. You know, one of the accusations when I came to North Lake is, you know, I come from a major institution that I'm trying to, you know, uh, press uh, for research and publish a parish and institute, you know, all this dichotomy that is uh, of a university setting. You know, like, no, I'm just here to serve people. Like, education is education. You know, we have a different population, we're just here to serve. Um, so there's many obstacles, but I think what I've always tried to do is hear people out, even my biggest um, challenges um, have been just uh, bringing those haters to the table and saying, okay, so what is, you know, what is it that you don't like? What is it that we're um, not agreeing on? Uh, one instance particularly when I was doing the diversity work, um, there was a professor, a tenured faculty member from Alabama who did, who said, you know, I don't even know I believe in this diversity, equity stuff in education, um, and your job is uh, really just a waste of money, and, and your degrees aren't even in business, so I don't even know why they hired you. And this is in the break room, so I was like, I'm just trying to get some ice to go with my coat. Right? Uh, I wasn't expecting all this bigotry to come at me. Um, and so, because I like a good challenge and because I got that communications degree, I asked the man to go to coffee with me. I paid for it, take my Starbucks, and we just started dialoguing. And he just feared what he didn't know. He was from a different era. He had been at the university for 30, 40 years, um, and he had never been around, you know, young black males. His perception or his bias was only what he had point of reference for. And so we just started dialoguing and talking. And by the time I left, he was one of the biggest advocates for inclusion. He wanted to flip his classroom. He wanted to see how he could connect with his diverse students. And so I asked him one day before I had left and transitioned, what was the change for you? Because when we had first met, you know, you were kind of brass and kind of difficult to work with. He said, well, I got to know you and I want to apologize because I just had judged you based on my point of reference. And there's all these trains as a faculty member. There's all this, um, and he used the term, you know, this pushing a liberal agenda which we won't get into that. But he had his own conceptions, but we had a dialogue and then we were able to have a friendship from that. And I still talk to him to this day. And the other key piece too was, you know, he had grandchildren who were now starting to date outside their race, who were going to places um, to where they were very diverse. 
And so he knew something that was near and dear to him was going to be engaged with his mercy. He wanted to understand it better. And so I think that was kind of the, the sound of like, okay, let me give this young black man a try because he may be able to help me understand my grandchildren better who are bringing home their first African American or their first Hispanic uh, or someone of the same gender. And so how do I navigate that? And so that's how I attack those challenges and obstacles. I, I, I tackle them head on. So you can hate me all you want, uh, but you're going to love hating me because we're going to interact together. So. I'm going to come back to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the last question. Beyond getting you to where you are now, how did you overcome the obstacles that you discussed? How did they impact you? So it made me uh, hungry for more. It made me be excellent more, uh, and not for the sake of someone else's definition, but for the sake of you know my own. Um, as a black man, I feel like I'm carrying a mantle. Like I'm, you know, a, a black man that's like a journalist breaker. Um, that's a millennial. Um, I own all my identities, right? Um, and whatever they say about us, I own it. Some are generalizations, some are stereotypes, right? Um, I'm a top six one, so no, I don't play basketball, so I don't put that stereotype. But guess what? Uh, I got some J's, I got some Jordans, I can go put them on. But that's not how you're going to define me because I also have research, I have a dissertation, I also know how to have. I can quote Chaucer with my friends, uh, Brandy and Neil, right? I can have an articulate discussion about literature. Right, so it makes me well versed. And so I'm not just what you think I am, I'm more than that. So it made me hungry for more. Uh, I think the other two things is, is that it revealed to me that ignorance that truly exists in the world because until you really encounter it, you don't really understand that like, these people actually believe what they say. Like, you actually believe that stuff? Like, um, the notion that um, African Americans had an extra muscle which made them faster on the track. Uh, and people actually believe that, right? And so, and when I encounter folks who say, well, you know, me, you all are good in sports because you have the extra muscle. And I'm like, so where did you get that from? Where did that derive from? And how can we unpack that? And so it's almost not a game, it's just so intriguing to me to help people turn that light on. I guess that's the educator in me. Is so like, there's a way of, you know, shaming you and, um, you know, going through this whole argument process. But let's use education. Yeah, I know you're ignorant. And, Bless your heart, right? But let's go through this process. I'm one of the ones who are going to walk alongside you until you get it right. And sometimes it's a blessing or burden to be as patient as I am. But I think the unique thing is, is that I get a, we get a choice. I get to, to check you, you know, the, my wife's from South DeSoto, like I got that in me, but I also can love you and show you that patience and grace. And by all means, sometimes I think we need that, that abrasiveness, and sometimes I think that peace. Um, and so I think that it's made me better because now I'm able to be um, in tune enough to know when the person needs it and when they don't. Now, when they're just plumb ignorant, oh, let's go all in, right? That's an uh, angry black man, every stereotype. Uh, when you mess with my babies, uh, I'm going in. When I, uh, and I talked about it on the panel last week, earlier this week, when my son was uh, engaged in the classroom, the teacher was sending all the black boys you know, to, for discipline, but when white kids were acting out, it was their spirited or they're just energetic. But what the black kids do, they need to be disciplined. Oh, I was angry black man. I'm just going to go ahead and admit it. I was up there angry black man. And I used my degrees and my influence, and I'm privileged because I have degrees, and I had enough uh, privilege to know I can go to the superintendent. But I think about those parents who don't have the education, who don't have the access to the superintendent, who are at least lost and left behind. So how can I use my privilege now? to help them because there's others who don't have what I have. So I want to use what I have in order to benefit my people, but also other people who don't look like me to eradicate ignorance. So I'm on this, this campaign to eradicate ignorance in the world. So I'm, I'm, I'm an ignorance uh, broker. I'm trying to get rid of it as much as possible. I like that ignorance broker. <laughs> and I love to talk, so. Uh, That's okay. I'm, I'm done, yeah, I'm done. So I get passionate about this stuff. It's fine. It's interesting. Yeah. And it promotes discussion. Okay. So, seriously, I'm, in, I'm intrigued. I'm impressed. Um, and I really like what you said the other day on the, on the event about your son and that you do take, you know, there are people out there that don't have the benefits. They don't have the privileges that you have. Okay. You've earned all of your privileges, but you are trying to also uh, be, be, be a voice for them. Right. Because not all parents would have gone to the school to find out what's going on. 
okay? Or, had they gone, they may have been pushed aside. But you could not be pushed aside. Right. Sometimes people perceive us in that angry black or yeah. automatically ignorant. But actually, I'm going to segue into that sellout. Yeah. So you got the sellout. Yeah. And this is a question, actually. I think you said this, but I want to. I want to make sure. Are you saying you felt the sellout from your own people? Yeah. Sellout tag. I grew up with that tag. Sure. Mm-hmm. Because my mother. She articulated every syllable. She would speak so slowly, we would say, Mommy, please, hurry up. We would articulate. We were raised that way. She didn't speak in slang. Now I can speak in slang, blah, blah, blah. But I've seen that. So not only are we faced with this, not the sellout from, you know, white population, we have another issue to deal with them, but our own population, we get the sellout, okay? I've actually seen where people will hold themselves back because they don't want to get that label. And no, we have to ignore that. Right. You don't forget where you come from. You don't forget your people. But we have to do mm-hmm. something. We have right. to evolve. And hopefully, hope. I love that you that you take it, you, you want your change agent, especially for the person that you worked with. What a change agent. Right. That you were able to shine some light you were able to get him to, to open his ears, also open his heart. Right. His heart, that's a big one. Right, yeah. you know? And to get him to listen and then learn and embrace. Right. So, but Kwame faced the same, the same thing. And his obstacles, you know, trying to be in a business world, basically in a white man's world, okay? Right. That's the truth. And push with he, his plan, his agenda without selling out to his place, but your homey attitude doesn't mesh all the time with the corporate world. Right. And that's the interesting, I think, the dichotomy because you have these competing, which self do I bring, right? So I come into a situation, which self, because everyone who's there is already going to determine based on what they see first, right? But you have... Does Harlem show up? Does, you know, the, the IT professional show up? Does, you know, does the Texan show up? Like, it's all combating now. You have a young black chef, right? Let's just take the title, right? Mm-hmm. Before we even read it, that right there has so much packed into it. Young, so obviously there's going to be an identity of um, black and then chef. Like, those don't even, do those go together, right? Um, because when I even look at the word chef, or look at the word black, my bias is already going to tell me what I should think about those because of word association. Right? Mm-hmm. So when you think chef, you may think Bobby Flay, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but can a black person be a chef and then be young? Because usually to get to chef level, you have to have years and years and years. And so, so is that a self-given title and all that? And so then when you actually read his story, you see all that he's gone through. So yeah, he's qualified to call himself a chef in his own regard because of his experiences. Right. Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily call myself a chef because, you know, burning popcorn with a microwave that qualified me as, you know, a chef, but I know how to cook food, so based on my experiences. So I think even when we look at labels, um, Yankee, um, Harlem Knight, um, those things, we really make an assumption about what that means. Sure. Um, angry, black, and aggressive, or assertive, right? Um, and so that's what I love about the book is that even the title itself leads you to think one thing, but then when you read his experiences, it kind of leaves you understanding why. And I even think I love the love these notes from the young black chef, which yes. means in case, what? Somebody's young taking notes? In the taking book? notes. And black chef taking notes? What? Mm-hmm. And so even that piece right there for me before I even read the whole book was like the was so impactful because of the word choice right there, because there's so many, uh, we see Dean, there's just this automatic apprehension, right? Or when we read, if we talk about when we see certain names on a resume, you know, how there's a, a, a loaded you know, kind of you know, bias that is there. You know, when people call us an ICU nurse and they see Kimberly's gonna be your nurse today. And they come in and see this this chocolate dark skinned lady in it. And they're like, oh wait, I didn't know that. I thought Kimberly was gonna be, you know, a young white girl from, you know, 
graduated from you know South uh, South Lake, right? And so, and, and I think my her experience is how she's had patients who said, "No, I don't want this black girl treating me. You know, I want a white nurse." And you know, her superiors that come and said, "Listen, she's the best on our floor. If you want to live, then you don't let the black nurse to treat you." Uh, and it doesn't matter what color you are, and she looks beyond that and still treats them with compassion and care because it's her calling to be a nurse even though they have hatred in their heart for it. So I think my calling out, I'm still gonna cook this meal for you, even though what I'm going through, because it's my call. Does that make sense? The yes, meal, like we do what we do as faculty and as deans because it's our calling. So whatever they do around us, you go to that classroom, Rhonda, every day because it's your calling, not even what your colleagues say, not even, but because you want to see students be successful. And that's why I love graduation because at the end of the road, like there, you see this this growth. And they're like, that's why we do. Okay, right. Dr. Kimberton, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Always a pleasure. Okay. Always a pleasure.